Okay, physics students, this is the second video in our all-important topic of forces, uh, another topic that you'll see really for the whole two-year course in the IB. Okay, and what I'm going to talk about now is I'm going to talk about Newton's first law, and I just want to point out that um, a lot of the uh, a lot of things about Newton's laws that I've already um, that I'm going to introduce to you in these videos are really things you already know, and it's not because you took um, grade 10 physics. It's because in your dealings of forces and vectors and so forth already in this class, you've already basically learned these things. Okay, so before we talk about Newton's laws, it seems to make sense to go ahead and talk a little bit about Isaac Newton himself. He's kind of this scientific icon, okay, that you've heard a million things about. And, you know, a lot of students of your age have heard so much about Newton that they're really sick of him. Sick of him uh, and his laws and his all of his scientific things generally mean um, tedium for you guys. But I just want you guys to br br brush that aside and really... Um, Think about what, a, what an interesting and unique person uh, Newton was and how he really changed the course of scientific and also human history because of his, um, because of his discoveries, okay? He lived from 1642 to 1727. He was an English physicist and mathematician. And among other things, here are some of the things that he did. Well, as you know, he formulated laws of motion, which we're going to study right now, and gravity. He built the first reflecting telescope. He invented calculus along with Leibniz. He developed theory of color via light through prisms. He developed laws of cooling, studied the speed of sound, he, and later in life he was the master of the royal mint in England. Okay, um, So he was a pretty busy guy involved in a lot of things. Um, and just a couple of quotes, uh, some famous quotes by Newton. There are a lot of quotes by him, but a couple of the famous, most famous ones. If I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, and then this one, I do not know what I may appear to the world, but I, but to myself I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself and now and then finding a smoother pebble or a prettier shell than ordinary whilst the great ocean of truth lay all undiscovered, undiscovered before me. Um, so, you know, pretty, pretty modest, um, pretty modest quote from someone who did so many great things, okay? Okay, before we talk about Newton's first, first law, we have to understand what's meant by this concept uh, of inertia. And what inertia is, it's the, the natural tendency of an object to remain at rest or in motion at, at a constant velocity. So, which is more likely to, um, which is going to have more of a natural tendency to remain at rest, me or this pen right here? Well, clearly me, because I have more mass. I have more inertia. And you notice that the unit of inertia is the kilogram. Well, the kilogram is also the unit of mass. And in fact, mass is the quantitative measure of inertia, okay? So you have the mass of many different items here, all the way from an American penny, which um, I guess on average has a mass of 3 grams, all the way up to a super tanker, which is 1.5 times 10 to the 8 kilograms, okay? Um, that's a pretty big range, okay? So remember, mass is not the same as inertia, but mass is a quantitative measure of inertia. So obviously, the less mass something has, the easier it is to change its state of motion, or more specifically, scientifically, to change its velocity. And this leads to Newton's first law of motion, which he formulated in 17, or 1687 and published in a publication called the Principia. And it's as follows. An object continues in a state of rest or in a state of motion at a constant velocity, which means constant speed in a constant direction, unless compelled to change that state by a net force. And a net force is the sum of all forces acting on it. In other words, whatever an object um, is already doing, it wants to continue doing that just by nature. And if it has more mass, more inertia, then it is more easily, it can more easily continue to do what it's already doing. Think of it that way. It's also called the law of inertia for this reason that I just described. And the purpose <clears throat> when a net force acts on an object is not necessarily to sustain the object's velocity, but rather to change it. And when the velocity changes, you have an acceleration. And because of Newton's second law, as you know, F equals MA, we're not talking about that in this video, then you have a force. Whenever you have an acceleration, you have a force, okay? Okay, so remember, the more mass something has, the harder it is to change its state of motion. So in this case, we have a little tugboat that's actually pulling a super tanker that's loaded with containers, a container ship. Wow, that's pretty amazing, okay? Which has more inertia? Obviously, the, uh, the container ship has a lot more inertia, but the little tugboat is able to actually pull it across the channel. 
And I just want to uh, tell you guys about the fact that sometimes Newton's laws do not hold between reference frame. And what I re mean when I say reference frame, inertial reference frame is really the technical term for it. It's a frame of reference in which Newton's law of inertia is valid and it does not accelerate. So between different inertial reference frames, uh, Newton's laws do not hold. And I'll give you an example, okay? All right? The Moon-Earth system. Well, <clears throat> if you look at... Um, Relative to the Earth, the Moon is going around it at a constant speed, correct? All right, so that's a certain, from the frame of reference, the inertial frame of reference of the Earth, the Moon is going around it at a more or less constant speed. Now, if you look at the Moon, the path of the Moon compared to the Sun, it does this crazy kind of flower-shaped um, path. So clearly, the Moon is, our, the, the, our Moon is not going around is it does not have a constant speed. You see it speeds up and slows down and speeds up and slows down. This is actually called retrograde motion um, in the astronomical sense. You can see that in the frame of reference, the point is that you can see in the frame of reference of the sun that the moon's motion is not the same as it is in the frame of reference of the earth. It's not going at a constant speed. It's slowing down significantly and speeding up, okay? So Newton's, law, Newton's laws are only valid within, inertial, within any inertial reference frame, okay? Um, and I'm going to show you guys a bunch of demos in class that will be kind of fun for you guys, okay? All right. Okay, so here's an example of thinking, keeping in mind Newton's first law. Go ahead and try this one on your own, and, um, and I'll also show you the solution. You're going to have to think about this one for a little bit. Okay, so a cup of coffee is sitting on a table in an RV. The cup slides towards the rear of the RV. Interesting. According to Newton's first law, which or more of the following statements could describe the motion of the RV? The RV could be at rest and the driver suddenly speeds up or hits the gas pedal. The RV is moving forward and the driver suddenly speeds up. The RV is moving backward and the driver suddenly hits the brakes. Turns out it could be A, B, and C. It could be any of them. Okay, um, if you, and if you think about it and draw some diagrams, maybe we'll do this in class if you need some help with this one, um, and draw vectors. Um, this is a classic case of inertia. Okay, um, yeah, so that's that. All right. Um, so inertia, the, Newton's first law has lots of uh, lots of applications. It's all around us, all all the time, every single day. Here's a funny case of a little kid on a skateboard with a bucket of water, and you can see that when the skateboard stops, the water doesn't, and the water sloshes out. Clearly a case of Newton's first law. The water, because it's relatively massive, has a lot of inertia, and it really wants to keep going in that direction, but it can't because the bucket that's holding it is stopped. So <laughs> the water splashes all over Mr. Potato Head. Here's another example. A guy, a guy sitting in a chair, reading, his, reading a physics book, minding his own business, He's going to stay at rest, okay, until there's a force, a net force that causes him to not be at rest. And the force, in this case, is a force of his buddy running into him and knocking him down in the snow, okay? So all examples of Newton's first law, okay? All right. Okay, other examples of Newton's first law. Again, it's everywhere all the time. Crash test dummies or maybe even a person in a car, which is unfortunate. The car stops, the person doesn't, the person has inertia, the person is traveling in this direction, the car stops suddenly, but the person keeps going. And guess what? Relative to the car, the person goes forward really quickly and is the crash test dummy, the head goes through the windshield, okay? Here's another example, okay? All right. Um, these are eggs being dropped from a height from a building, okay? They have inertia, all right? Now, they want to keep going. But the ground is stopping them, okay? And so the ground is imparting, imparting such a force on them that they can't hold together, and they smash, okay? This is more, this deals with other uh, physical laws, maybe more so than Newton's first law, but I really liked that video, so I wanted to put it in there, okay? Here's another one. This is an amazing video. This is an amazing video of the inside of a car crash, okay? All right, the inside of a car. So these people, they want, again, kind of like the crash test dummies, okay? The, uh, the airbags go off, all right? This is slow motion. The air, these people were okay. They're just actors, okay? So the glass, everything wants to keep going forward, including the guy's glasses, due to their inertia, the foam, everything goes forwards. Terrible things happen in a car crash because these things are changing their 
uh, velocity so quickly, they have a very, very big force impa imparted on them. So like the eggs, they can't handle that big force acting on them, and they're actually destroyed. They actually break apart, okay? So amazing stuff. All right. So I want to talk a little bit about equilibrium. We've talked about this in class, but I'm going to formally talk about it in this case. Equilibrium is a situation in which no net force acts on a body, or the sum of all forces equals zero. Now, this symbol sigma, this is a Greek letter. It means the sum of or the addition of. The addition of all forces on an object, it equals F net, and that's a vector. Okay, this is also a vector, equals zero. If that's the case, the object is in equilibrium. Now, it doesn't mean that the object is not moving. It means that the object is not accelerating, meaning that it could be moving at a constant velocity. Now, often several forces act simultaneously on a body, okay? And F net is the vector sum of all of them. And this, uh, this, really, goes, uh, this really goes back to Newton's first law, okay? And that is that an object continues at a state of rest or in a state of motion at a constant velocity unless compelled to change the state by net force, okay? That's Newton's first law of motion. That's really conditions for equilibrium, right? Okay, Newton's first law is really one about equilibrium. So to find the net force on an object, you just use vector addition. And thank goodness that we studied that already. So for example, we have these people pushing a car. Okay, you've seen this example before. Okay, there's an opposing force of 560 newtons. Here's your free body diagram. The net force on the car is 110 newtons. Um, as 110 newtons towards the front, right? Towards the front of the car. Therefore, the car is moving. We already did this one, okay? If the opposing force were greater, say if, if this opposing force were 670 newtons, okay, the car would not be moving since the net sum of those vectors is zero, okay? Okay, so again, to find the net force on an object, what you want to do is use vector addition by components, and F net, the sum of all forces, is the vector sum of all forces. Now, if the object is, not, is either not moving or moving at a constant velocity, you need to set all the components equal to zero, okay? So the sum of all the horizontal components is F1x plus F2x. One and two denote different forces acting on the object. And you set all the y components equal to zero. So this is going to go back to right angle trigonometry and vector, uh, vector sum and vector components and so forth, okay? So here's a f kind of a funny example. I guess it's not funny if you're this guy. Okay, go ahead and read this example and try this one. This is a descriptive solution to this example. This guy's pretty scared, okay? So if an elephant were chasing you, its mass would be very threatening. It has a lot of inertia. But if you zigzag back and forth a distance as you ran, okay, uh, <laughs> this guy is obviously not doing that. Maybe he never took a physics class. I don't know. The elephant's large mass would be to your advantage. Why is this? Well, the reason is because the elephant has way more inertia than you do because of its greater mass. It will have difficulty changing its velocity suddenly going back and forth. If it tries to follow you in such a pattern, it will have to slow down. You could easily outrun it going like this, but it can probably outrun you actually going in a straight line. So don't ever do what this guy is doing if you're being chased by an elephant, okay? Okay, here's another example. This is the one of the crate. You cannot escape this, this example, the one with the crate. The, the, the inclined mass or the inclined plane with a mass. Go ahead and read this one. You've seen this exact problem before. Okay, so you need to deduce that the crate is at rest and not sliding. 3.2 kilograms inclined at 30 degrees. All right. Okay, when the force from the crate towards the bottom of the plane is greater than or equal to 21, the crane will start to the crate will start to slide downwards. Okay. Well, again. Here's my weight vector. I break my weight vector into the horizontal and vertical components um, compared to the actual coordinate system, which itself is tilted by 30 degrees. And you notice that the x component, um, the x component is 15.7 newtons. Okay, wx. Now the magnitude of wx is equal to the magnitude of the static frictional force, okay? And this is way less than 21, so therefore the box is not sliding. So we have deduced uh, numerically that the crate is at rest and not sliding, okay? I want to also point out a few more things and take this example a little bit farther. Note that the green vector, that is the normal force. The normal force is, is less than the weight vector because it's tilted. The normal force is exactly equal in magnitude to the y component of the weight. You see that? And it's pointed equal and opposite. Remember, the normal force acts perpendicularly to a surface, um, okay? And also note that the vector sum of the normal force 
and the static frictional force, which is shown up here, right up here, the vector sum of those two equals exactly the negative, negative of the weight vector. So this blue vector pointing upwards, that is actually the negative weight vector. Okay, so you see it all really does make sense. Okay, let's do a couple of examples. This is a, some past paper questions for you guys. Example five, go ahead and read this one. You might want to draw a free body diagram and draw your vectors before you answer it. Okay, so my free body diagram is I have the weight of the suitcase acting downwards, uh, the normal force, uh, the magnitude of the ver vertical reaction of the floor in the suitcase, that's the normal force, that's R, okay, and she's pulling up with a um, vertical upwards force of P, okay, so because it's not, because it's not moving, all right, we can say that the sum of all forces is zero, and the sum of all forces is R, plus P minus W. And when you solve for W, W equals R plus P. Get it? Okay. How about this one? Skydiver 80 kilograms falls vertically with a constant speed. Determine the upward force acting on the skydiver. Interesting. Remember we said that F is proportional to V or V squared depending on the speed? Okay. Here's my sort of free body diagram of a person. Okay. All right. If the speed is constant, then the sum of all forces is equal to zero, okay? Which means that the upward force acting on the skydiver is exactly equal to the skydiver's weight because they're in equilibrium, so that would be 800 newtons upwards, okay? Last example. Go ahead and read this one. Okay, so you're asked to find the tension in each string, okay? TR, TS, T, okay? All right. So I've broken this down. I haven't drawn a free body diagram. I've basically just drawn vectors on the diagram. Note that using right angle trigonometry, you get the all of these relationships right here. Okay, And I note that since the object is in equilibrium, the sum of the uh, horizontal forces is zero and the sum of the vertical forces is zero. And then what you basically do is you set up a system of two equations and two unknowns. Okay, I end up that, um, I end up that S equals 17.9, okay, that's the tension here, okay, and I now, and I'm plugging that value back into equation one up here, you want to study my methodology, I get 14.6 for R, and obviously T was 20 as given in the problem. You're going to want to probably pause and rewind this particular slide and really make sure that you understand this problem and my approach to solving it, where I've set up two equations with two unknowns and gone back to solve them mathematically.